are. Now things are in focus. You've chosen to focus in on your menopause your way. And I'm Menopause Taylor, your ultra-focused teacher. We focus on every aspect of menopause in this YouTube channel, and we do so in a very direct, careful way so that you learn everything you need to know in order to succeed in managing your menopause your way. Right now, our focus is on Alzheimer's. It's a big unit that I started in video 236. And here we are at video 257, the 22nd video in this unit. Now, after schooling you on everything you need to know about your brain, learning, memory, and Alzheimer's in the first 17 videos, I started giving you the lifestyle measures with which you can prevent Alzheimer's. And today, this video focuses on yet another lifestyle management option for preventing Alzheimer's. Focus! And since the opposite of focus is distraction, that will be the flip side of our discussion today. This is a very critical video. It's one that everybody should watch, whether they're female or not, and whether they're menopausal or not. And that's because our world has become one that is so inhospitable <laughs> to preserving your brain and preventing Alzheimer's. There's just too little focus and way too much distraction. So, if you have my book, all of chapter 33 is on Alzheimer's. This particular part of it is special and video only. In video 246 on normal and abnormal brain aging, you learn that focus is one of the things that your brain does better and better with age. But you also learn that life presents more and more distractions that interfere with your ability to focus. So we'll address how this dichotomy affects your risk of Alzheimer's. And we'll also address how being more focused and less distracted can decrease it. In the very first videos in this Alzheimer's unit, I taught you all about the basic building blocks of your brain that enable you to learn. Discovered that learning, all learning, consists of connecting neurons. The more you learn, the more you're able to connect neurons, even distant neurons, from one side of your brain to the other. But what I left out of that lesson is the fact that in order to even begin to learn anything, your brain has to focus on the subject. So if you really want to be technical about the order of events in the learning process, focus comes first. Focus first. Now, focus may entail looking at something closely or repeating it. Sometimes it entails writing it down. And at other times it entails listening carefully. There are all sorts of ways to focus on something in order to learn it. But Whenever you encounter and try to learn something for the very first time, you must focus on it in order to learn it. But learning doesn't stop there. After that first exposure, all you've done is connect neurons. You've made new connections, but it's not a very strong one. What makes it strong is using it again and again and again. The more you use that connection that constitutes something you've learned, the more fixed it becomes. It becomes permanent knowledge or an automatic skill. Another name for permanent knowledge is memory. Well, preserving your memory is what preventing Alzheimer's is all about, isn't it? So focus plays a huge and critical role in your ability to learn new things and in your ability to remember them once you've learned them. Now, one of the other things I've taught you is that the more you repeatedly use something you've learned, the more automatic it becomes. And the more automatic it becomes, the less you have to focus in order to utilize that knowledge. Just think about muscle memory. 
Let's say that you're learning to play an instrument. At first, you will have to focus all your attention on the music and getting your fingers to play the notes that are written on the score. But every time you practice a piece of music, you'll get a little better at it. Both your brain and your fingers will learn the music. And with time, both your brain and your fingers will memorize the music. Eventually, you'll be able to play the piece without even thinking about it. The memory will be so solid that it doesn't really require thinking anymore. It's almost like your fingers have a brain. So this is the sequence that is necessary every single time you attempt to learn something new. Here you see the four steps that ultimately create a memory. Focus is first. Then there's the connecting of neurons. After that, you repeatedly use the connected neurons. And only then does it become a memory. So what's the opposite of focus? It's distraction. It's anything that impairs your ability to focus. And distractions come in many forms. The older you get, the harder it is to ignore distractions. So what did I just say? Did you have difficulty focusing on what I said while you heard unexpected sounds and saw unexpected things on your screen? Did you even notice that I was talking at all? Were you able to make out my words? What if I imparted the take-home message while all those distractions were occurring? If that were the case, would you have completely missed it? Well, here's what I said. The older you get, the harder it is for you to ignore distractions. Now, all of those distractions were beyond your control. They were all imposed upon you. Plus, they ranged in terms of the kind of distraction they constituted and in terms of how bothersome they might have been for you. The point is that regardless of the kind of distraction, they all prevented you from concentrating on the lesson on which you were trying to focus. These kinds of distractions are everywhere. Nowadays, you cannot watch your television screen without little messages popping up in the corners. You can't go into a doctor's waiting room without seeing some obnoxious program playing on the television. When you look at the news on television, there are all sorts of changing colors in the background. Some even have people moving around behind the newscasters. Movies have so much action occurring at once that it's difficult to pay attention to the central one. Telephone calls are answered by machines that play the same out of tune melody over and over again, interrupted every 20 seconds or so by the same voice telling you not to hang up because your call is important. Restaurants think it's trendy to have clanging dishes, shouting waiters, and uninsulated walls that ricochet sound. Strobing lights are intended to be cool. It's socially acceptable for your phone to ping loudly every few seconds when you receive yet another text. Distractions are everywhere. They are so pervasive that people feel uncomfortable with total silence these days. Are you one of them? I'm not. There is never a sound in my home unless I make it myself. <laughs> If I'm not playing the piano, it is completely quiet. I have no TV, no radio, no YouTube on, nothing like that. I have no distractions. Why? Because I'm always thinking, and I find that distractions impair my ability to think. Every time a friend comes to my house, they comment on how peaceful it is. And I tell them, it's always like that. And they say that their house is never quiet, usually. They find mine so relaxing <laughs> that they threaten to never leave. And I can't say I blame them for wanting to stay. <laughs> now, so far we've only listed distractions that are beyond your control. What about 
about the distractions that you either invite into your life or create yourself. Texting is optional, you know. It's one distraction over which you have almost total control. Just because everybody else wants to text does not mean you have to. I find texting to be one of the most annoying things I have ever encountered. You could be sitting there minding your own business, focusing on your work, and bing! Your cell phone screen lights up making a bing sound and interrupts your train of thought. And if you don't stop what you're doing right then and turn all your attention to the phone, it does the whole thing again about a minute later. I hate it. So I don't text. And I train everyone in my life to refrain from ever sending me a text. I just tell my friends, I do not text. If you want to communicate with me, send me an email or call me on the phone. I will not respond to texts. <laughs> when a merchant sends a text reminding me of an upcoming appointment, I go to the appointment, <laughs> I show them the text, and I say, I do not want to receive a text from you of any kind for any reason ever again. I don't need a reminder for my appointment. I put it on my calendar. I don't forget it. And I always arrive early. It works just fine. If you can't refrain from sending me texts, I will have to refrain from being your client. Plus, I affect that stop option on every text I get from a merchant that I don't visit. And guess what? There are no texts in my life at all. I hardly ever use my phone for anything. I find it to be the most annoying device I have ever seen. <laughs> most of the time, it's not even in the same room with me. I actually like being free of it. You see, this goes back to the 1980s when I was practicing obstetrics and gynecology, and I was really important then. Now I'm not. <laughs> but then I had to be available every minute to my patients. The lives of my patients and their babies depended on it. So I had a cell phone that was the size of a brick and it had this little leather case on it with a handle. <laughs> and I had to carry that cell phone along with my beeper everywhere I went. But everybody else didn't have mobile phones. Mine was a tether necess necessitated by my job. But nowadays, it's just the opposite. Now everybody else has become so important that they can't be without their phone for even a minute. It's all just so odd to me. I love ignoring my phone. <laughs> I know I'm not important anymore. <laughs> but I notice that most people have a cell phone in front of their, in their hands and in front of their face most of the time. They look at it as if they're focusing on something. But they're really not. While they're looking intently at the screen, the screen is flipping and changing and jumping from one thing to the next. There's no focus. It's just a device that houses endless distractions. And people have become so addicted to distraction that they feel nervous without it. Do this. Go sit somewhere that enables you to just watch other people and leave your cell phone at home. Just go sit quietly and watch people. You will discover that hardly anyone else is just content to sit and either focus on something other than a cell phone or just to sit and observe the world around them. And the problem with this need to be distracted all the time is that it impairs your ability to focus on anything long enough to learn anything new, which impairs your ability to connect neurons, which impairs your ability to repeatedly use connected neurons, which impairs your ability to create memories. So your self-imposed distractions are as damaging to your brain as the distractions that are beyond your control. The more you fill your life with things that are distracting and that have the potential to disrupt your focus, the more you increase your risk for Alzheimer's. And your cell phone is one of the most distracting things in your life.
Don't you remember how much more peaceful and stressful your life was before you had a cell phone? How often do you just turn off your phone so that it can't distract you? What do you do with it when you go to bed at night? Is your phone in your bedroom at night? Or do you make sure it's elsewhere so that it can't disturb you? Do you turn it off so that it can't interrupt your sleep? Or, does, or do you let the phone dictate whether or not you get adequate sleep? How you use your cell phone can have an impact on whether or not you get Alzheimer's. In a way, you can give yourself Alzheimer's. I'll bet you never thought of Alzheimer's as a disease that you give yourself, have you? Well, I hate to be the one to bear the bad news, but what happens to you is up to you. Wouldn't you hate to end up with Alzheimer's simply because you couldn't put down your cell phone? Now, there's another way in which your cell phone increases your risk of Alzheimer's. It induces your brain to default to lazy mode so that you consult the phone rather than thinking for yourself. If you have to add or subtract, are you likely to use your phone as a calculator or do you do it in your head or on a piece of paper? If you write out an email on your phone, are you more likely to think about how to spell a word or are you more likely to let the phone decide which word you meant to write based on your misspelling of it? Your phone is not a brain, nor is your computer. Neither one will ever come close to the power of your own brain, unless you stop using your own brain. And all this technology that offers artificial intelligence causes you to do just that. I've noticed that people are either getting much dumber or they just don't care about the, how they spell, write, punctuate, or calculate. I'm a nerd, so I am anal about all of those things. I hate the functions on computers that correct things for me. I turn them all off if I have the option because they turn my work into unintelligible gibberish. But most people love the fact that the computers do so much for you. I don't think it's good. If you ask me, artificial intelligence breeds natural stupidity. And another thing, computers induce you to react to all sorts of things at once. When you go to your computer to look at your email, do you focus on them one at a time, ignoring all the others until you get to them? Or do you glance at the whole list before addressing them? Do you feel a bit anxious if you receive a whole lot of emails at once? Do you find yourself feeling a bit scattered as you try to patiently take the time to address each mail individually? What about when you go to the internet to research something? Go look up something on the internet and you'll get the text surrounded by all sorts of ads that are moving and changing and trying to get your attention. Some of them flicker, 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 flicker. And the ads have nothing at all to do with the topic of your research. They're things that you shopped for recently. Talk about distraction. It wasn't that way when we used encyclopedias. Another interesting thing is that we tend to medicalize certain behaviors and outcomes in a way that makes people think they have no role in creating their own diseases. Instead of saying that you're unruly in school, your parents tell you you have ADD. That's attention deficit disorder. The term ADD is relatively new, but the behavior isn't. We've just labeled it so that it sounds like a medical condition over which you have no control or accountability. Well, call it whatever you want. The bottom line is that the effect on your brain and your risk for Alzheimer's is bad either way. ADD is not your friend and it will rob you of your brain eventually. What about multitasking? Are you the kind of person who talks on the speakerphone with the TV blaring while responding to a text in the midst of cooking dinner and filling out a form for something? If so, how well do you do any one of those things? Do you think 
you just divide your brain into little pieces so that each piece can do one of those tasks? Or do you think your brain has to switch from one to the other, giving each only a few seconds of attention? It should be no surprise to you that it's the latter. If you really want to be honest with yourself, you'll realize that you make a lot of mistakes when you try to multitask. You probably pause at the wrong times in your conversation, you probably can't follow the storyline on TV, and you probably write unintelligible sentence in your text. I'll bet that dinner is actually missing something too, and the form is probably a mess. The end result is that you probably do all five things poorly and sloppily rather than doing just one of them well. No matter how much you decide to delude yourself into believing that you can multitask, you can't. Study after study after study has shown that the human brain cannot focus on more than one thing at a time. That is, if you want to do anything well. Now, if you don't care how sloppily you do things, then fine. But if you think about the fact that you make mistakes even when you are focusing on one thing at a time, it will make you think twice. How in the world have you lulled yourself into believing that you can do more than one thing at a time and do any of them well? You can't. So multitasking consists of multiple distractions while you attempt to focus on more than one thing. It's like taking everything that's bad for your brain and assaulting your brain with all of it at the same time. So here's our nifty brain buildup and brain breakdown chart designating how more focus and less distraction build up your brain. And of course, here's the opposite result showing how less focus and more distraction break down your brain. So the lesson for today is that focus is favorable and distractions are deadly to your brain. So feed your focus and starve your distractions. Do as much as you can to inject more focus and less distraction into your life because focus and distraction have a huge impact on both learning and memory. Impairment of either one is a setup for a high risk of Alzheimer's. So that's it for today. Join me again next, next week when I'll talk about reducing your risk of Alzheimer's by decreasing your risk factors for a heart attack. And don't hesitate to go to menopausetaylor.me to schedule a consultation, subscribe to my channel also, and follow me on social media. Bye!